Coming up, 98-year-old Choctaw veteran Bill Parker has been recognized by the PBR for his service. The Native Ways Federation gears up for its nonprofit day, and writer and director Tazba Chavez tells us about her latest work coming soon to a TV near you. I'm Aliyah Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach, and research, taught by world-class indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. Amirawa Hopa, thank you for joining us. We start our newscast in New York, where an Ivy League school is dealing with fallout after Native American remains were found in the school's archives. Cornell University has returned three sets of ancestral remains to the Oneida Indian Nation. The remains were, ma were unintentionally discovered in 1964 while digging for a water line. They were brought to a university professor who placed them in storage within the school's archives until their recent discovery during an inventory check. Oneida Indian Nation representative Ray Hellbritter said it included an adult man, a child four years or younger, and another child who will be laid to rest. As required by the law called the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, the remains, as well as 22 funerary objects, were returned. The university president, Martha E. Pollock, explained during the repatriation survey that the remains should have never been taken originally. She also issued an apology on behalf of the university. Now to an update on former actor Nathan Lee Chasing Horse's criminal case in Nevada, which reveals additional criminal charges that have been filed. The Dances with Wolves actor is accused of sexually abusing and trafficking indigenous women and girls in the U.S. and Canada since the 2000s. Last week, a grand jury added counts of kidnapping, lewdness, and drug trafficking to the already existing charges of sexual assault, trafficking, and child abuse against Chasing Horse. He was arrested at the end of January near the North Las Vegas home he shares with five wives and remains in custody at the Clark County Detention Center. Chasing Horse is not expected to appear in tribal courts after being banned by tribal leaders a decade ago due to human trafficking allegations. Now to Arizona, where a native basketball team has won another state title. The Lady Falcons of El Chase High School are back-to-back -back state champions in Arizona's 3A division. The girls' basketball team clinched their second title after beating the Sholo Cougars 52 to 35 over the weekend. The teams from both schools had a high number of players from the White Mountain Apache tribe. Because of that, nearly 15,000 fans, including those coming from tribal communities, were on hand at Arizona, Arizona's Veterans Memorial Coliseum. The Falcons won eight of their last nine games before making it to the playoffs. Head coach Rick Sanchez said the win was a dream come true. White Mountain Tribal Chairman Casey Velasquez said Said the nation is now working on a community event to celebrate the athletes. Scottsdale, Arizona is the site of an art market for indigenous vendors looking to share their crafts. It comes as more native artists are making a push to sell their items directly to buyers. ICT's Daniel Herrera was there last weekend to speak with some of those creatives. Music, laughter, and culture. <laughs> That's what you would hear as you walk around and explore the 40 indigenous vendors at the native art market. From jewelry, to pottery, to photography, all these indigenous artists come here to have a space of authenticity. It makes me feel like there's, like what you said, there's a space for us. There's some place for us, for Native Americans to be recognized and that 
the that our art is being shown um, and that it, it's authentic and everybody here is authentic and that's really I mean that's important to get that out there and and for people to identify that um, that it's not fake as people walk and check out all the vendors the market has to offer younger generations can look to them for inspiration uh, it influences kids it influences um, entrepreneurs that you know you can do cool stuff now the market hosts vendors from across arizona all who come here to showcase their art a market exclusively for native artists puts them into the spotlight and showcases native american culture been coming here for the last couple of years it's a very good very good outlet for a lot of uh, uh, artists. If you missed the market this week, don't worry. The Native Art Market is open weekends November through March. In Phoenix, Daniel Herrera, ICT News. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. The Native Ways Federation has announced the date for its second Native Nonprofit Day. It is a giving initiative aimed at increasing support for Native-led organizations around the country. With us here today to talk about that is the organization's executive director, Carly Badhart bull Welcome to the ICT Newscast, Carly. Thank you, Alia. So at a high level, tell our viewers about the Native Ways Federation. Well, uh, hello, friends and relatives. Uh, I'm Carly Badharpel. I'm the executive director of the Native Ways Federation. We're also known as NWF. We're a national Native-led nonprofit, and our mission is to activate and expand informed giving through donor education and advocacy. So currently, we have three key priorities. One is uniting Native nonprofits and bringing collective voice to our work. Um, two, advocating for Native-led nonprofits. So especially in philanthropic spaces, as our third priority is to influence philanthropy. We're focused on increasing support for Native-led, specifically nonprofits. And we were founded over 15 years ago by a group of national Native nonprofits with common a common agenda item related to access to philanthropic resources or the lack thereof, um, and a collective drive to do something about it. Our founding members consist of six of the most well-respected organizations um, out there who have been around for a long time. You know, the Association on American Indian Affairs just celebrated their 100th anniversary. Other members include Native American American Rights Fund, American Indian Science and Engineering Society, National Indian Child Welfare Association, American Indian College Fund, First Nations Development Institute, and the presidents and CEOs of our founding member organizations make up our board of directors. So over 15 years ago, they started coming together their leadership from their organization started coming together around um, issues related to the lack of adequate support to Indian country by philanthropy, which unfortunately is still a huge issue today. Research has shown that less than half a percentage of philanthropic dollars are making their way to our communities. And that number is even that number is questionable as the number to native led entities is is even lower. Uh, and so that brings us to another aspect of the issue our founding members started coming together around was that the larger grants supposedly going into Indian country were going to non-native organizations and whether those resources were actually making their way into our communities was particularly questionable at best and again this is still an issue that philanthropy needs to recognize and change. Um, our native-led organizations know how to best support our communities. We're the ones closest to them as we're, we're part of those communities. So Native Ways Federation is aimed to be a resource for the native led nonprofit sector and philanthropy as we aim to increase awareness and support for native led organizations. Tell us about your upcoming native nonprofit day. What is that? So Native Nonprofit Day, we're really excited uh, to announce this is going to be our second year. Uh, it's a national giving initiative aimed at increasing support for Native-led nonprofits. So everyone um, is encouraged to uplift Native-led nonprofits leading up to and throughout the month of May, leading up to Native Nonprofit Day on May 19th uh, in 2023. Native Nonprofit Day started in 2022. Uh, we had our inaugural year last year after we were approached uh, Excuse me. Native Nonprofit Day started last year after we were approached by representatives at Google and offered a free domain as part of their .day domain initiative. 
And we chose to amplify the importance of supporting Native nonprofits by launching nativenonprofit.day. So if you go to nativenonprofit.day, you can find more information um, currently. And then if you sign up on our listserv, you'll get more information as we get closer to Native Nonprofit Day. Um, but we're solely focused on supporting Native Lent. Uh, we launched the campaign last year and over 150 organizations, nonprofits, foundations, individuals participated to raise awareness on the importance of supporting our, our organizations organizations. You know, again, as Native-led organizations, we have the solutions to address the issues facing our community. And there's incredible work that's happening across the sector in a multitude of, of areas from education, language revitalization, climate change, access to health care, addition, you know, addressing issues in child welfare and the law, you name it. Our communities are doing important work across the board. But we need increased support to do our work as effectively as possible and at the level that we know that we're capable of. And so our team has created a, a toolkit with various resources for Native Nonprofit Day. We're in the in the process of updating our toolkit from last year, along with some additional resources. And we'll share those with those who choose to participate. It's going to be available at nativenonprofit.day, and you can go there to sign up to get more information. Um, we hope to utilize this as a, as a fundraising mechanism, and we, we define native-led um, as or native controlled as organizations with at least 51% of their board and leadership identifying as native. We're also particularly interested in supporting those organizations whose mission is focused on serving native communities and tribes, um, which so far seems to always be the case when over half the board and leadership is native. Um, we did choose the third Friday of May for Native Nonprofit Day this year and moving forward. Uh, so this is not a not a one time, not a two time thing. We do hope to continue beyond 2023. Um, and we also chose this date because we wanted to do something um, different from Indigenous Peoples Day, from Native American Heritage Month. We want to encourage folks to be thinking about us year round, not just on those specific dates. Well, Carly Badhart Bull of the Native Ways Federation, thank you so much. Absolutely. The U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs says of the 16.1 million Americans who served during World War II, 99% of them are no longer living. One of those veterans that's still around is Choctaw citizen Bill Parker, who stormed Omaha Beach in the summer of 1944 during D-Day. At 98 years old, Bill was recently given the B Cowboy Award given by the professional bull riders in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and he joins us now virtually with the help of David Rule. Hello to you both. They want, want you to say hello. Oh, hello. Both of them. Let's start off uh, with this recent award. Uh, Bill, what does it mean to you to be recognized at this level? When we went to the PBR, how did it feel when all those 15,000 people stood up and yelled for you? Well, first place, it was a surprise. And next, made made kind of wobbly on my feet. But when I got stood up, it made me feel good, real good to think that that many people would recognize me. You were fresh out of high school when you were drafted to the U.S. Army. Uh, what do you remember about those early days of service? Your early days of service, Bill, when you were drafted, when you were 18 years old. Well, about all I can tell you, to start with, I didn't want to go. I uh, was 18 years old. I lived in the Fourth County down at the foot of the mountains. We run our cattle in the back of the mountains, and I, one of my jobs was to see about those cows. I was a cowboy, and that was what I wanted to be. I, I went back every day to see about my cows, and uh, that's the way I started out when I was, oh, I'm going to say 12 years old when I started looking at them because my mother didn't think I was old enough to go in the mountains, but my, my dad did. He knew if I got lost, he could find me. Anyway, that's the way I started out in my teenage years. And, uh, 
Well, all kinds of things happened to me when I was a teenager. I went wherever I wanted to went because I had a good horse and saddle, and that one didn't have much control of me. But I still had a job at home to do, and I always done that before I left. But I, one of them was to see about the cows. So I went back in those mountains ever so often, at least twice a week, to look at our cattle. And I went back there one time, found up all the cows in a hurry, because I hadn't seen them all before the last time. And then uh, I found a big vine of grapes, in big blue grapes. I rode up under that and sat there and eat grapes so I couldn't eat anymore. And I come out of the mountains then on the other side from which I went in, but I come to a road that went back across to the one I was supposed to be on. And I went down it, and when I got up there about a halfway, I met a girl at the mailbox getting her mail. Of course, I had to stop and talk to her. I didn't know her, but I had heard of the pretty girls of Rosedale, and I see if she is one of them why they were pretty. Anyway, I stopped and talked to her for 45 minutes or an hour. Finally, she told me she had to go to the house because they was calling her. So I, she went. I didn't see her anymore that summer. I thought about her every day, but I didn't see her. That fall then, when they were having pie suppers to sell for Christmas, have trees, that's what been the first of December. Why, I heard when this little community of Rosedale was having their pie suppers. And <clears throat> I decided to go. Well, I went home and told my mother that I was going to pie supper. And of course, she had to earn me some clothes. She wouldn't let me go looking like I was. Made me clean up. Anyway, she earned my clothes. And then she asked me about money. And she said, you can't go to a pie supper without money. I said, I can't go then, I guess, because I don't have any. And she said, well, go to your daddy and see if he's got some. That is just like getting it out of the United States. What well, a beautiful story there. Thank you so much for telling us about uh, your late wife, Colleen. And thank you so much for joining us. We send you the very best. Said thank you for joining us. Oh, OK. B oh. Bill, Bill was probably the only man that stepped on Omaha Beach on the first wave that fought all the way through France, Belgium, Holland, and into Germany. He's probably one out of the whole company that made it that far. Well, we thank him for his service so very sincerely. Thank you so much again. From hit shows like Reservation Dogs and Rutherford Falls, Tazba Chavez is a force in television today. Her latest endeavor is writing and directing an episode for a crime drama Accused on Fox. There are twists and turns throughout the episode following a group of friends and the drama that follows their attempts to shut down a uranium mine. ICT's Paris Wise sat down with the creative for a behind-the-scenes look at the project. So you wrote and directed uh, an episode of Accused on Fox, which premieres tonight. Very exciting. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the show and the episode. So Accused is, um, it's it opens on a courtroom defendant and uh, it's an anthology series. So every single episode is different. And um, so the viewers will know nothing about the crime, but you'll see um, 
some folks are the defendant or defendants in our case on trial. And so it's told through the defendant's point of view through a series of flashbacks and you sort of find out why they ended up in trial to begin with. And the episode that I co-wrote and directed is about a group of Navajo friends who are arrested for protesting a local uranium mine. Um, and they come up with a plan to try and shut it down in goodwill. Um, and then we see what happens from there. Somehow they ended up in a courtroom, though. And how did the opportunity to be a part of this present itself to you? I used to be the co-chair of the Native American and Indigenous Writers Committee for the Writers Guild of America West. And um, maybe like a year and a half ago, we created, uh, we participated in sort of like speed dating um, with different showrunners. So each committee member or each uh, Native writer in the, um, the committee, they put down a list of like the four top showrunners they would love to have a meet and greet with. And so Howard Gordon, who's the showrunner of Accused, was on my list. And so you had an hour with four different showrunners, you know, 15 minutes each to just say hey and, and introduce yourself. So him and I met uh, during that time. I was actually in my trailer shooting reservation dogs and I had this meet and greet with Howard. Went great. He was wonderful. And then about a year later, he came back and said that they he had this show and there was an episode that they wanted to do on environmental justice issues with indigenous people. And he wondered if I was interested in, in hearing about it. And so I heard about it and um, I was like, please let me do this. Uh, you know, my mom is an environmental journalist growing up. My dad is a formal tribal chairman. I grew up sitting at dinner tables where environmental activism and issues were discussed all the time. I spent a lot of my spring breaks uh, at protests. Back then it was in Nevada for nuclear waste test sites at Yucca Mountain. And so when they came to me with this, I was like, yes, I would love to do this. Please choose me. And so um, that's sort of how this came to be. Speaking of working with other great people, Robert I. Mesa, Kiowa Gordon, Natalie Benali, Forrest Goodluck, they're actors in the show. How was it working with them? Uh, they're incredible. Uh, I had the best cast. They are so, each of them are so talented and bring such a different dynamic um, to the episode. They work really well together. All of them were such a joy to work with because it's like they're so open to to trying things and they you know they also have great relationships outside of the set so I think that really helped some of them had known each other for years um and then each of them I sort of had some touch point with you know like Robert I had met years ago and we had some friends in common Kiowa had been on reservation dogs Natalie actually met as a dancer first um years ago when I was doing poetry and she was dancing and then um, Forrest, I've, I've been an admirer of his work. And so, you know, it was sort of the dream team of cast that I was able to pull together. And it was the dream to be able to cast as many Navajo actors in these lead roles as possible. And we did a pretty good job, including with Deanna Ellison. Um, she plays our attorney as well. This episode covers a very real issue in Indian country. Does that make your job as the writer, director, easier or more difficult? And can you walk us through why? I was very conscious that the scenes that we're recreating are things that a lot of our actors, our background actors have probably experienced in real life. And so we took a lot of care on set to make sure, like, for example, our medic, um, I had her, uh, she carried on her sweetgrass, sage, tobacco, uh, when the background extras showed up who were all First Nations folks, who I am so thankful that they showed up because people were like, we can't find that many Indigenous background. I was like, yes, we can. It's called Instagram. Um, <laughs> it's called Facebook. So, you know, for example, when that bus pulled up with all of them, I went onto the bus and I just with the medic and let them know that I understand that we are portraying a protest scene. I understand that we're portraying tear gas. And if at any point that becomes triggering or hard or you need to take care of yourself, our medic has sweetgrass, she has sage, she has tobacco, whatever you're needing for whatever, however your people pray or you need to take care of yourself, please let us know if you need to step away. And so we did that with all of these hard scenes so that people also knew that they were taking care of spiritually and as human beings. And I think in that way, I hope that it was an easier time for people to shoot versus 
putting people through more trauma and not being considerate or even acknowledging that that might be something that's hard for them. Um, so to answer your question, I think like, yeah, it's, it's, it's both. It's like, it's difficult to, to get right. And then I think you can make it easier on people if you go about it in a good way. You've written and directed for other major TV shows that have been indigenous led. What was it like to bring your voice and this story into this space where there's many different voices of different backgrounds? Yeah, it, it was incredible. I mean, I have to give a lot of respect and gratitude to Howard Gordon because when he went on this journey to have this anthology series and to have different communities of different backgrounds and issues, he really, I think, walks the talk in terms of handing over the pen and handing over the set and the camera to the people who understand these communities best. And, you know, for for myself, that meant that, you know, being able to co-write it, being able to um, direct it, being able to cast who we wanted, like him and, and Fox and the entire crew really went to great lengths to be able to bring this world to life. And so I think you know, when you look at the anthology series and you see all of the different communities it's going to represent, I love that we have an episode. I love that we have a very powerful, very nuanced episode and that we were part of the conversation of injustice and the justice system in America, um, because I think so often we're sort of like left out of a lot of that. And so um, it's been very, very cool. Um, I'm super, super proud of the work that we did. Well, your episode of Accused will be out tonight on Fox. Accused airs every Tuesday and episodes are available to stream on Hulu the next day. Writer and director Tazba Chavez, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Paris. I appreciate it. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.